Hello again guys, how's it going? Hope you're having a fantastic day. Hello again guys, how's it going? Hope you're having a, uh, a fantastic... Hello guys, how's it going? Hope you're having a fantastic day. So today I'm going to share with you guys a deck guide for a new deck I've been using to play in Masters rank on North American servers and we reached uh, top 10 NA so it was fantastic and we actually ended up placing rank 9 so it was a new height for me. This is going to be a Heimdinger and Leona deck. The theory behind this deck when I was crafting it is that basically tempo and developing board is quite important in any type of deck whether it's aggro or even control deck. Control decks need to develop tempo. So I thought Flash of Billions got buffed, let's revisit Heimer, let's throw in some strong uh, mid-range units in the daybreak Leona can service like semi win condition mostly stall and sometimes can threaten some wins but mostly buys you plenty of time develops a really strong early game leading into high mid later into the game if we must and then playing star shaping in our spells to develop more generation uh, I'm actually quite surprised I have been recently diving a lot into deck building more than usual and uh, this is finally something I felt like really confident in uh quite happy with the work i did here so happy to share it uh very excited to share it actually so let's go through a list two copies of sunburst axes removal in a region it doesn't have very strong thick removal but we do have thermo beam as well but sunburst just feels really nice and the silence does become relevant it also serves with more uh, daybreak synergy but this is a pretty this is a pretty sturdy removal i'm quite liking sunburst lately but i'm not going to use any more than uh two copies because sometimes it can brick uh, star shaping two of uh, earlier iterations of the deck uh, actually I actually wasn't using star shaping but then i found that uh, healing is quite relevant and this just uh burst speed alongside with heimer digger kind of becomes relevant too you can sometimes heal your units too star shaping is just a really incredible card again i'm only going to use two copies of this because uh deck spacing was quite uh tough but yeah star shaping great fit uh ravoon three copies of alongside with the daybreak leona three copies solari priestess three copies shield bearer and solari soldier these are like the cookie cutter uh daybreak units ravoon just uh, acts as more generation two and just it's a pretty solid unit it develops gener uh value and uh cards that develop value are quite good this deck does uh tend to run in quite a bit of hand sizes though because it is very greedy but it works in a greedy kind of meta so unt until things start to fast uh fasten up we might change things fast enough. Is that the right word? Until things start to speed up, we might change things. I'm getting a three copies of a uh, hush, a single copy of. I find hush could be two copies of instead of Bastion. I like this. I like this mix here though. Hush is the most valuable at one of, and Bastion finds the most value at one of too. Specifically, because every now and then it's going to do something amazing while protecting Hybernigger. Uh, you can easily go for two hushes, uh, two hushes if you like. You can also go for two Bastions if you like. However, Hush really proving to just be, you know, you, you guys know what Hush does. Uh, two get excited, uh, mostly because it's just a decent removal. We can sometimes thin out, thin out our huge hand size with it. And also every now and then, because we are playing Flash of Brilliance now that's been buffed, Flash of Brilliance every now and then will get us uh, the, what's the Skies Descend, which is almost unplayable in this deck. Having a couple of get excited can like kind of utilize the, the poopy cards we get from Flash of Brilliance to sometimes push face damage or to uh, remove your opponent's stuff. Uh, dealing three is quite a good number. Obviously three Flash of Brilliance. Uh, like this card literally carries Harmadinger. I think without this card being at three mana, even though we're not getting like the elusive tyrant, we're just getting insane generation of value. And that's like what I find is really key with Harmadinger at the moment. It's not about the elusive meta. It's all about just the value and just like having good refill. Flash of Brilliance is pretty good. And in this region of cards, I will go ahead and like de uh, sidetrack for a bit here. But if we look at all the six uh, mana plus cards, so go six, seven, eight, we go to spells. You actually find some decent cards from here. Like all of these cards are great, except for the Skies Descend. So the two get excited do come in kind of clutch. Hex deck, although we don't main deck it, is actually quite an incredible card at the moment. Like, low-key, because we sometimes develop boards quite effectively, uh, hitting this on one of our units to get rid of one of our opponent's Lidroses, for example, is actually huge. Um, every now and then, the Hextech does prove to be very effective. However, don't main deck it. It's very niche. Sunburst is a great pickup. Unlicensed Innovation just develops more board state and, you know, uh, spells for uh, Heimendinger. Even True Shot Barrage is not that bad at the moment, especially when you're having such a strong early game. 
Curving out into these cards later in the game is quite useful, but as I said, Disguise Descend is the only brickable card, so you have five decent options. Uh, two copies of Pale Cascade. I don't really want three copies of this. I think two is just fine. The deck space was getting very tight, but I do like the card draw every now and then. It's mostly here for card draw and spell uh, synergy. Uh, three Mystic Shots is great. Uh, three Guiding Touches is great. And as well as three Thermo Beams because P and Z. And that like wraps out the list. Uh, let's talk about the Mulligan for a sec because it's, I think it's very interesting. So for the Mulligan, in general, no matter what matchup, Curve out with your Daybreak units if possible. You can sometimes keep Lerna in the opening hand if you have a decent curve too. But also, keep Heimerdinger in slower matchups. Like when, when we're going up against War Mothers and stuff like that, where they're just doing nothing in the first few turns, keeping Heimerdinger is fine. We won't keep Flash of Brilliance, however, but we will sometimes keep Heimerdinger. And only keep Heimerdinger if the rest of your hands make sense. Like if you have like Ravoon, Star Shaping, and Sunburst, and Heimerdinger, you probably just want a full Mulligan. That doesn't seem like a reasonable keep. But let's say, like, ideally you have, like, Solori, uh, Solori Soldier or Thermo Beam, maybe Bearer and Mystic Shot. You can keep Heimerdinger. I think it's absolutely fine, and it's very important that we do find it. Every now and then, you may keep it in the opening hand, and then you will draw two. That's okay. Uh, just depends on the matchup. Against ag aggressive decks, I even do keep this as well, only if the rest of the hand looks great. If I can develop against the early game board from my opponent, because Heimerdinger is going to generate us a lot of torrents that we need to like stabilize. It gets to a point where you have to like kind of face tank a bit of damage so that you may play Heimerdinger and play a bunch of spells. But oftentimes you won't have a lot of spells too, so you're going to make sure you play at the right time. Because sometimes when you pile out this deck, you'll be more focused on the day breaking and uh, removing your opponent's stuff even prior to Heimerdinger. And sometimes you'll just kind of like hold back all your resources for Heimdinger. It's a really fun deck. There's lots of different ways to play it. But in general, the finalized, the mulligan's just all about finding the stabilization against the early game. If it's a Bilgewater burn deck, keep your Mystic Shots and stuff like that. Even keep Get Excited every now and then. Um, if we're going up against like slow warm of this decks, go ahead and keep Heimdinger. It's just going to do you a good, uh, a lot of justice. So I have done a fair bit of these deck guides, right? And uh, mostly I talk about the deck for a period of time. I give a brief mulligan discussion, but like, I think what people really want to know, and uh, I'm going to try and share as many tips as I can here, is like, what cards to play and win, fake hero? Like, what is the most effective time to do things? And I'm just going to start spitting out just little tips, just uh, kind of things to look out for, uh, just for a moment here. And I think that should help you guys understand like why the deck is doing what it's doing. So basically one of the first tips I do want to share is the fact that like this deck it looks like it doesn't make sense, but it, it makes sense, guys. Like, you use Leona to uh, stabilize the early game board. So, and when I say that, like, Leona, you don't always just slap it down on curve. It really, look for the matchup, look for the positions where you might be better off, like, saving it for your opponent's turn five, so that you may play it to buy a turn. Like, oftentimes, you can use this to stop your opponent from swinging with Trundle, which is decent, or just, like, anything with Overwhelm. Uh, sometimes you can look for like even like depending on how much daybreak you have and if you're curving out with daybreak like sometimes you can like go in with like leona's morning light with a thick board and try and even stun your opponent's board here and there ravoon's uh daylight spear will make daybreak active all the time which can lead to multiple stuns with leona uh, sometimes you can just beat them decks down in mid-range look at your hand state and just think about like how I can pile the deck to a victory because it does shift every game. Uh, it's not a very straightforward game plan, but we do have the insane late game that you can shift at any time. Like you can choose when you want to like go in. And I think that's really cool. And that's what I like about this deck. So like when you look at star shaping, star shaping is for healing, but it could also be a tempo tool, right? This card's really insane. So in periods of the game where you've curved out maybe with Leona, and you're at a point where you can maybe play Heimerdinger or you can play Star Shaping. You might even just consider playing the Star Shaping, healing your units if you need to, depending on the matchup or your face if necessary, and then finding a big threat. Also with Solari Priestess, I find that um, most of the time with the current meta, picking up Fallen Comet, which is the obliterated enemy, is going to do you a lot of justice most of the time. Like, if you're unsure of what to pick, Pick Falling Comet, it's just a very safe pick, it's a very powerful card, and you will get that value later with Heimdinger if you need to. I don't oftentimes pick up Written in the Stars, I am, I'm not finding Written in the Stars to be too good, and I've usually got like Heimdinger or Leona in hand at this point, and mostly I'm looking to kind of start pushing uh, pushing my win condition, which is to play Heimdinger earlier. So Written in the Stars is like 
delaying all that another turn, which I don't like. Uh, I usually don't take the units too often. I think Fallen Comet is like literally the go-to and the sisters are generally quite powerful. But yeah, as you're picking your invoke, it's another, just in general, not even with this deck, but as you are invoking, that's, this is a period of time where you really have to think about it. Like, take your time. But as I said, if you're unsure, go for the Fallen Comet. It's going to be really great. However, don't take Fallen Comet if it's like a bit more of a faster matchup, but you already have a Sunburst in hand. I also find that the, uh, what's the other one? The one that deals four and deals one, very effective against boards like uh, decks that go wide because this deck does struggle against uh, wide boards. So if we ever verse uh, Jinx Draven, it's a bit tricky as well as uh, Bilgewater Burn, but that doesn't mean we're super unfavored. I still don't mind that matchup and I've generally had a pretty good time against both. With Star Shaping, obviously with the Invoke Celestial cards, some of them could be unplayable and generally some of them might be unplayable. If you find yourself in a situation where you're looking for a certain out and you've played Solari Priestess earlier in the game and you have Star Shaping, I, I don't usually find myself in scenarios where I need to find the invoked cards that require the Celestial activation. So most of the time I use Star Shaping to find something that's like going to end the game. So like more elusive units, uh, more overwhelmed, the big units guys. Uh, but in general, there won't be many scenarios where you miss it. Thermogenic Beam, um, always keep it against Bilgewater Burn. And I want to do, I do want to mention this. If you're attacking on odds and you get like a Thermo Beam and a Solario Soldier in the opening hand, which, a bit, which will both be great keeps against that deck. If you're attacking on odds, so I mean you're attacking first and your opponent can develop, always pass immediately. Don't play the Solari Soldier. You can actually pass against them and see what they do. And they, they usually are going to play like a Precious Pet or a, uh, a Precious Pet or a Legion Saboteur, that's what's going to happen most of the time, and you can clear that immediately, which is really effective. And then you can save your Solari Soldier on turn two when they want to develop into you. You can play Solari Soldier and it like stops their attack completely. But what might happen here and there is they might like not have a turn one play, you miss a turn, but that's fine. We're a deck that wants to be reactive anyway, so don't hesitate to be passing a lot of the time on turn one if you have Solari Soldier and Thermo Beam in the opening hand. As I said, both great keeps against Bilgewater uh, aggro decks. Um, if they do go ahead and play, which they sometimes do play it, uh, what's the card called? The one minute card, Ravenous Butcher. No, that's not the card. You guys know the card. Yeah, if they play Jagged Butcher on turn one, you can just play Solari Soldier and swing at them, that's fine. Because if you don't, he's going to swing at you next turn with the Jagged Butcher, so that's a bit of a problem. You might consider differently if you have Mystic Shot. You can happily just skip anyway, use the Mystic Shot. Because like the following turn, you'll be able to play Solari Soldier into Mystic Shot. Or if they open attack you, you can just Mystic Shot them too. So that's fine. Uh, similar things with Shield Bearer. Like if you see opportunities too, like this is very powerful on your opponent's attacking evens if they're playing an aggressive deck. Um, if, if they're playing a control deck, feel free to just slap this down on if you're attacking on evens and attack. But uh, if you're versing an aggressive deck, you can consider like holding this back for your opponent's uh, offensive turns. And you can really slow them down quite a lot. A flash of brilliance, like I don't don't play this unless you have Heimdinger. Like if it's sitting in your hand, there's no need to play it. Like you really need flash of brilliance for Heimdinger mostly. Unless you're in a rough situation and you're trying to look for an out, then you can go ahead and play it. But in general, avoid flash of brilliance until you have Heimdinger on the field. Or if you're looking for like a different strategy, like as, as I said, if you're looking to try and end the game through like Solari Soldier and like all the day breaking. You can like play it, but you're not gonna find anything that should help you push. Maybe you find like some burst so you can clear a unit and get some more daybreak synergy. But in general, yeah, Flash of Brilliance, pretty straightforward. Save it for Heimdinger most of the time. Another quick tip as well, in general, just like don't hesitate to like block with like your Leona or block with your Ravoon. If your opponent's kind of like pressuring you quite a lot, like these are literally just stabilizing the early game, as I said. So I, oftentimes I trade off my Leona. I do trade off my Ravoon, unless I see an opportunity that I think I might have a slight chance of doing some daybreak stuff to try and win the game. Only if you're in a rough situation, just trade them off. Don't worry about protecting them. HP is a resource and against aggressive decks mostly, just be careful. Uh, and then because always go Heimerdinger for the late game bombs. So you don't have to sweat about that. I hope you found this uh, video useful. If you did, please leave a like. It makes a huge difference to the performance of the videos and this, it helps out a tremendous amount. Um, if you have any other further questions about the deck, 
want to pick my brain, uh, jump down in the comments. Alternatively, jump over to my Twitch, drop a follow, jump in. I'll probably be playing a lot of this deck over the next few days. So yeah, a t link to the Twitch is in the description. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. I hope you guys have a fantastic day and good luck on ladder. But for now, I guess we'll be versing some bilge water burn with only misfortune. For some reason, this person doesn't want to run GP. I'd be curious how it performs in the mirror matchup though. This is actually a fantastic hand. I'm going to keep it. If he's only running misfortune, he's all in on misfortune and get excited clears it. Hey. I went from plat 4 to plat 180 LP just tonight. Wish me luck in the next game. Dude, good luck in your next game. That's fantastic. Uh, why am I so hot and cute? Ask, ask my mother, dude. Ask my mother. Wow, we've got a fantastic curve. You've got this, man. If you don't get it, don't sweat it. You'll get it next time. It will come. I have full confidence in you to win your next game. One hundred viewers. Yeah, you can thank a uh, absolute legend, saucy mailman, for that one. What a nice guy. Um, Solari just shuts down his attack much more than Solari does. Wait, hang on. Sorry, the soldier shuts down the attack much further than Priestess will. You mean this guy? I love him too. He's one of the originals in the Runeterra community. Like when I started playing this game, he was like up there. Original. What happens if you play a spell that costs more than eight with Heimer? You still get the T-Rex. So eight's the cap. Anything higher mana cost doesn't really net you any value. Pretty sure I'm just slapping Leona, right? Like we're doing very, like this is the other spectrum of this deck and how I expect it to perform. Every now and then I just curve out with Daybreak, stabilize against aggro decks, play Heimerdinger, if I must. Sometimes I can just win the game this way. Feels a little bit counterintuitive sometimes, but I don't know, I really like it so far. I'm pretty fine with just trading down my board here. I can almost swing with this one too. Nah, it's pretty greedy. Daybreak curve is really absurd. It's 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 really good. It also matters though whether you're going first or second. For example, Solari Shield Bearer is incredible on um when your opponent's attacking on turn two if they're in an aggro deck. It's absolutely incredible. I do have Guiding Touches and uh, Star Shapings in this deck, so hopefully we can find them. If he develops Misfortune, I'll develop Heimerdinger. Sorry, I'll develop um, Ravoon. If it's something like wider, we'll see. If it's just straight up Decimate, then... You know what? I think I might play Ravoon this turn. I think we're going to skip the Heimerdinger strategy. And we're just going to completely stun his board next turn. Damn it. So we'll definitely open up with a Priestess. We might find something useful from her. Like he's got six mana. Meteor Shower gets a lot of work done too. How much damage am I threatening as of right now? He blocks four, blocks five, blocks three. That's not enough damage. Could he have units in hand? 
We do this because if he wants to spend mana playing Noxian further, we might just be winning if he has no development. If he does this, he must clearly have some developments. Otherwise, that's a lot of damage. I'm already pushing enough. Or am I? He blocks four, blocks five. I push six. Yeah, we're putting him down to... Uh, that's, that's not good. Crackshot Corsair. That's kind of spooky. There's only one good trade he can make here. So I'm just going to swing like this. Damn it. I needed to kill him this turn, guys. That is a good sign for us, though. So how's he get out of this situation? Crack short curses, pushing a bit of damage. You cannot sway me. Go down to seven. Yeah, it's fine. This is fine. That's weird. I wonder if he, like, this is kind of like very weird, right? Like he's using the make it rain, but I don't think he realizes that crack shot's actually going to deal more damage to my Nexus. So maybe his hand, his last card must not be direct damage. So like him using that make it rain there is actually fantastic for us. It means less damage goes into my face and less damage means less dead. Let's play a priestess. Probably just take the warrior. I don't think we need falling comet. Oh. The make it rain hit my face though? No, it actually didn't. It hit my units. Or oh, did it? Did it hit my face? I'm sorry. Oh, it did hit my face. Guess it didn't make much of a difference then. Pray for no further next turn? That's fine. I can beat further every time. Because I'm the first person to threaten lethal, he has to respond with Noxian further. So there should be no way for him to get out of this game actually. And we just found star shaping, so. We're fine. Daylight everlasting. Daylight everlasting, guys. GG, thank you. Thanks, guys.